I've always liked this uh, Twin Ports logo. I just think it's very snazzy. Uh, and this is the cover of the 1911 How to See the Duluth Superior uh, brochure. Just a nice piece of artwork. And you'll notice it is the original uh, aerial bridge with the little car that ran back and forth. And uh, this is from a different brochure uh, showing their system. Pretty much shows the whole thing. Um, and if you've got a, a copy of Twin Ports by Trolley, this wonderful panorama is um, about two thirds of it are the frontispieces, pieces, I believe you call them. You know, this left side here uh, is in the, the front and then this is in the back and this third over here, um, I didn't have enough page width to make it, but I, I just love this thing. Of course, it shows the, the offices of the Duluth Street Railway. If you hear noise in the background, that is them cutting PVC pipe for my new water heater. I hope it's not too objectionable. Um, so anyway, the Duluth Street Railway started uh, on Superior Street uh, with about, mm, I don't know, three miles or so of horse car. And horse car is numbered, I think, one through 12. And uh, they ran until, uh, I want to say, 1890, 91, and then they electrified it. And then they sold these uh, same group of horse cars to the Park Point line, which used them for several more years. Whoops. And so we started out on Superior Street. Here's a postcard view. Uh, the most common uh, postcards in Superior Street are always at about Fifth Avenue West, which is to say a block east of the, uh, this says Fourth Avenue, um, a block or two from the railroad stations. This is kind of where the big theater was and the big hotels were. And of course, all the lines in Duluth funneled down in through Superior Street. Uh, this is the nerve center. This is the corner of Third Avenue West. And this is where uh, the main line on Superior Street diverged from what they referred to as the hill lines. And uh, they turned the corner and went up, uh, oh, about a 9% grade, uh, two blocks to Second Street. And so this is where the inspector's um, shack was. And he went and regulated the cars. And he also sold tokens and uh, provided information to people. And here, of course, you can see the aerial bridge in the background. We're now at 7th Avenue West. And this is where Superior Street curves to go around the Point of Rocks. It's a block west of the two stations, the Duluth Union Station that houses the uh, Lake Superior Railroad Museum today. And if they ever get the North Star express Amtrak rain running, it'll actually end here. And then this is the Sioux Line Depot. But to the left here is the base station for the incline. This was the transfer point to the incline. And so a couple of pictures of the incline. There were three incarnations of the incline. The first in 1891 used these big garage sized cars. And you can see there's actually a wagon on this one that went up to the top uh, to a big pavilion this always just keeps doing that. Um, and then uh, they had the catastrophic fire up at the top that caused one of the cars to break loose and crash. And so in 1902, they rebuilt it and they rebuilt it with a single car and a counterweight on the other track. And for the first time, they put intermediate stations on it. You can see one of them, two of them up here at the top. And that lasted until 1910. And the ridership was so extensive uh, that they had these uh, really packed standing loads, uh, especially during the rush hour. And as a result, they felt the need to rebuild it again. And so uh, Twin City Lines actually did all the work. And so they built two cars um, and they, they put in completely new stations and a new base station. Well, actually new at the top too. Um, so there were like five intermediate stations to serve the hillside uh, and a new station at the bottom. And these cars went back and forth. And um, unlike the um, earlier ones, which were steam powered, uh, there was a, this was run by a big electric motor. There was a, an engineer at the top who communicated by telephone with the cars. And one of the characteristics of the station spacing is that when one car was at a station, the other car would simultaneously be at another station 
except for Fourth Street, where they met, both at the station. So this is looking down where it crosses Second Street and really gives you kind of an idea of the angle of it. And in the distance, you can see the hill lines came up Third Avenue West to Second Street and went down a few blocks before climbing up the hill further. So um, this is on uh, Masabi Avenue. So this is just only about a block above the base station. Now, there were also sidewalks and stairways that paralleled this because it was in the uh, planted right of way of 7th Avenue West. And I didn't know they had tasty bread back then. How about that? So here we are up at the top. And at the top, at the top you had, the, uh, this is, was both, they had a waiting shelter here, but this was where the engineer was. And he's looking down the thing and running the cars. And then of course, the transfer to the Highland streetcar, which was an isolated streetcar line that had two smaller streetcars double-ended and it ran 1.8 miles and it climbed the, it was like 520 feet from Superior Street up to here. And then this went another 120, 130 feet uh, up into the Highland uh, neighborhood. And once again, we're up at the top here, and you can see the connect the connection. Now we're back down, and we're on the mainline route. This is Superior Street going around the Point of Rocks, and this would divide into three into four lines rather. Uh, the first of the lines was West Duluth, and it went right out Superior Street past the car barn, and then under the ore docks. And here you're looking down, and this is um, Superior Street going under the or uh, going under, and it also served the ballpark here. And they had a siding off to the side to serve the ballpark. And then this right here is Grand Avenue. Back at 21st, uh, the line split, and the Grand Avenue cars came over and ran out through Grand. Well, there was a lot of open land west of uh, between Duluth and West Duluth. Now West Duluth was part of Duluth, but it had started as a separate community. And so this is Oneota Avenue, uh, which uh, is the West Duluth line closest to the bay. This is west of the ballpark. And it looked like this here for a mile or two. Now this is Grand Avenue. And this is, uh, it says uh, 24th, 4th Avenue West. Uh, the ore docks were at, I want to say, about 34th Avenue West, and it was west of there that things thinned out considerably until you got out uh, to West Duluth. Now, West Duluth uh, had its own little downtown, and this is the corner of 57th and Grand, Grand being the main highway, and they had a branch up Grand Avenue with the intention of eventually extending it to Proctor. They never did but this is the Proctor bus coming in, which duplicated the 57th Avenue line. And so the long line, um, they, they ran out to 70th West, which was pretty wide open until 1916, which is when they opened up the shipyard for World War I and they opened up the steel plant and uh, the line was extended. Here we are out at 92nd Avenue West. Um, and there was a lot of open country out here until you reach these two big traffic generators. But each morning during the war, they would send something like 30 streetcars out of Duluth and West Duluth to take the workers out to these plants. It was really quite huge. Uh, here's a shelter here. And this, by the way, uh, was also Highway 23. And so out in... Um, Morgan Park, which was the planned town built by U.S. Steel, and the U.S. Steel plant is up around the curb. Uh, curve. All the buildings, all the residences, well, actually all the buildings were made out of gray concrete block, and this is all still there. Um, uh, the steel plant is gone, but all the housing is still there, and it was single-family housing in the southeast corner with bigger houses for the managers, and it was multi-family housing the further west you move with duplexes, fourplexes, and apartment buildings. And the, the uh, streetcar just ran right down the median. So it was a planned community. You can see here's the TCRT overhead wire poles. And here you are at the entrance to the steel 
No, and uh, there was a turn loop here. A bunch of the cars ended here. Other cars took a right turn here and uh, continued on to Gary and New Duluth. And Gary and New Duluth were um, actually annexed as part of Duluth, although they appeared to be separate suburbs. And Morgan Park was restricted to uh, only certain white people. If you were, uh, you had to be Northern or Central European to live in Morgan Park. If you were Southern European or Eastern European or black or anything else, you had to go and live in Gary and New Duluth. And according to uh, the book I've read about the history of Morgan Park, uh, it was considered by the black residents and there were a couple 300 of them in Gary, New Duluth. Uh, Morgan Park was considered to be an unsafe place to be caught. So here it is heading west from Morgan Park, uh, getting uh, along Commonwealth Avenue. Up on the hill are the uh, Duluth, Winnipeg, and Pacific and the original Northern Pacific short line. And so here we are coming into Gary. Uh, it was side of the road and then it entered and Gary was Gary was a little was kind of a substandard housing not a very rich community. So now we're going to go back and they had a short line off the, just after point of rocks called the Piedmont line it was only a mile long, but it had about nine 10 percent grades. Uh, and as you can see if you came around the corner you might you might meet uh, an automobile. So here is, we're back at the corner of Third Avenue West, and this is the hill lines. And there were um, the, there were three lines that took off, East 8th Street, uh, Kenwood, and East 4th Street. Uh, and they went up two blocks and they went zigzagging up the hill, I think to kind of minimize the amount of time that they had to be working the brakes. This is a handbrake car coming down the hill because uh, all the little single truckers had handbrakes on them. In later years, after 1936, they abandoned that hill on uh, 3rd Avenue uh, East and instead ran everything down Superior Street to 2nd Avenue East. I'm sorry, they were on 3rd Avenue West to 2nd Avenue East. And this, for the two blocks and the three years that it ran, was the steepest streetcar grade in uh, Minnesota at 10.5%. So here they are up on a uh, second street, two blocks above Superior Street, passing the old Duluth uh, Central High School. And uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, this is the corner of Third Avenue West and Fourth Street. I think I actually have these out. They had a little line that ran on West Fourth Street, the West Fourth Street shuttle. And you could actually walk to downtown faster than this took, because it took you four blocks down the hill. Um, but you could, if if you didn't mind walking, uh, the west end of this and the east end of this were four blocks apart. It's just it made this big, kind of uh, safety pin shaped uh, route to get you down the hill. Okay, um, the two hilliest of the hill lines were 8th Street and Kenwood. And this is 8th Street shortly after it was built. They only have single track in there. At this point, you're about, I want to say 500 feet or so, 450 feet up the hill from the lake. This is a view when they were building it. And this gives you an idea of the hill where um, if you went down the street a block, the roof, the roof of uh, one block down is equivalent to like the basement of the one in front. And so they would go uh, tiptoeing down these hills, um, a, uh, you know, two blocks at a time. Uh, this is an 8th Street car and it has just turned the corner onto 7th Avenue East where, where it's going to go down the hill. The Kenwood line continued going further up another several blocks. And it wound up, I want to say, about 600 feet above the lake. And this is that same car, the same camera. And once again, you're looking down the hill. This is not. Does somebody, somebody got a question? No. Okay. Um, 
you also had the Lake Avenue line, which was the line that went to the aerial bridge. Um, and this is Lake Avenue, and it was right down by the waterfront. And I think a lot of this was built on fill out into the harbor. You can see it, uh, yeah. And so the Duluth cars would pull up to the, um, to the end of track just before the aerial bridge. And this whole thing was timed. So the streetcars on both sides were timed that they'd pull up, there'd be a couple of minutes and the aerial bridge made a trip every 10 minutes. And they get on the aerial bridge and then there'd be um, a park point car waiting on their other end. This of course uh, was before the aerial bridge was actually built and you had to cross the uh, ship canal uh, on either a ferry or walk across the ice in the wintertime. But these were the last horse cars in Minnesota. They lasted until 1899. So after Park Point was, um, was electrified, it ran out along Minnesota Street. And of course, the side streets were only half a block long, ending in sand dunes. So this is kind of a typical view from the 1920s. The Park Point car house. And of course, the fire car that ran on Park Point because you couldn't get a fire engine out there. You couldn't get a fireboat to it. So this was how it worked. They had a little car barn right across from the regular car barn. <clears throat> and this is during the reconstruction of the aerial bridge into the lift bridge as it is today. And you can see that both structures are actually contained uh, within it. And so this is one of the Birney cars that they ran out there in later years. So then to cross into Superior, Superior street cars were narrow gauge whereas Duluth's were standard gauge. And so in the winters of 1894, 95, and 96, I wanna say, um, they went and built a trestle on the ice. And since the superior cars being narrow gauge were lighter, they put them on the trestle and they would go over uh, to Rice's Point and transfer passengers to the uh, Duluth cars. And Duluth, of course, took over the system. And they also came out Superior Street to Garfield Avenue. And Garfield Avenue ran the length of Rice's Point. And eventually they built the, uh, the interstate bridge out here. Um, and so you had railroad yards on one side and then grain elevators and all kinds of other industry on the other side of Garfield Avenue. And so that, that was actually kind of a traffic source on its own. And then it made a left turn, crossed the bridge and went into Superior to connect the two. And so here's the bridge. Now this photo was a little bit misleading because in this, the bridge was actually built by uh, the Great Northern Railroad. And um, the trains ran in the center span and that this wood trestle leading to it had burned down and they hadn't replaced it yet when this picture was taken. But there were roadways, wood plank roadways on the side that the streetcars uh, took. And this is a later view of the bridge in the 1960s, but you can see Garfield Avenue, you came out here, went onto the bridge, and then, um, excuse me, I'm looking towards Superior in this. You came on Garfield Avenue here, went onto the bridge, and then on the other end, the railroad track takes off, and then the streetcars uh, continue down this street. And they continued down this street, to a bridge that isn't there anymore. You can see the center pier of the bridge. Uh, and they crossed this and then went down into Superior. We'll get another view here. Here we are on the bridge. And here is the view from Superior. You can see the bridge up here. And then the streetcar goes out of the picture for a little bit, but this one, the Lamborn Avenue Bridge, and you can see once again, the center pier gone. Um, was how they was how they got into Superior. Very interesting piece of streetcar, and they wound up, of course, running the length of Tower Avenue, which was this business and retail spine of Superior. And they went under at the intersection of Broadway was this big double illuminated steel arch. And so this is a panoramic view. The camera distorts what is actually a straight street. Uh, but showing you uh, downtown Superior. Here you see the arch at Broadway. 
So Superior uh, had horse cars, but they really only ran intermittently and they died once or twice. But this is a picture of the horse car. They had a separate car barn over in Superior. Here is car 73, which is an exact sister of car 78. And the, uh, the last of these cars ran until about 1920 or so. And so there, there were a couple of them still running in Superior. Oh my, I come back here. So uh, this is the South Superior line. And uh, South Superior was a little cluster of homes and businesses out at a railroad junction at 63rd Avenue, 65th Avenue South. Here we are at 30th Street. Did I say Avenue? I meant 63rd Street. Here we are at 30th Street, and there was simply nothing in between. Um, so this, as you can imagine, was not one of the more profitable lines, and this one went pretty early. The, uh, the best of the local lines in Superior was the, uh, was the East End line that ran uh, along the bay. And uh, this is, the, uh, there was the old Northern Pacific Depot for Superior, and so the tracks narrowed down to a single track to cross it. And one thing I learned is see these white painted poles? That was an indicator to the streetcar operators that they were coming up on a railroad crossing. Hmm. And so this line actually left Superior and went to, um, uh, it, to did I say it? Uh, Aloise, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And in the process, it had to cross the Namadji River on this rather rickety uh, shared bridge, which was later replaced by the Highway 53 bridge a couple blocks to the east. But this is it going under the Northern Pacific Zordok approach. And this thing went out and served, boy, oh boy. This thing went out and served the, uh, the Great Northern um, Aloise Ordok. So here is the car barn complex in Duluth at 26th Avenue West and Superior. Here's inside, you can see that it was actually built up on fill um, with, with wood pits. Here's the office staff. And I guess if you were a woman and you wanted to keep your hands warm, you had one of these big fur muffs. Kind of the, kind of the, 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 this is the uh, general manager uh, who was there for a long, long time. Uh, this building is still there. It's owned by, I think, an insurance company or something. These are the, uh, the World War I women conductors, or as they refer to them, conductresses. Um, there were 21 of them, and the last one uh, worked until 1929. Here's car 78. Uh, the purpose of this was just to show that um, we have it. I put this together. I put this together, of course, for uh, people in Duluth. Here's, oh, of course, most of their big two. Uh, Double truck cars were built by Twin City Lines and were identical to the Twin City cars, except that for some reason they used a different fender. So here's one as a gate car. And then, of course, here's 265. And there's 266, which, of course, is identical to 265 as rebuilt in front of the car house. And when we saw it, well, we had the sign painter go and replicate the signs. And so I thought this was kind of cool to be able to show then and now. Now, when they rebuilt them for one man operation, a bunch of them got all brand new seats with, uh, with leather. Oh, I don't know if it was leather or vinyl or what, but some kind of upholstery like that. It is my understanding that 265 had these seats. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with the wicker we put in, um, but that's as it was earlier. Technically, it's now a mix of dates with the old seats, but the new interior. And then, of course, there were the uh, four lightweight, five lightweights, the Twin City Lines built that ran in Superior. And here is car 303, uh, the last of them, uh, the one that we're kind of sniffing around trying to decide if we wanted it or not. They had um, a three or four of these Twin Cities built snowplows. And then of course in 1931, 
uh, they started running their first trolley buses as an extension of they abandoned the eastern end of the um, of the Lakeside Lester Park line and turned it into a trolley bus shuttle from 62nd Avenue East to 45th Avenue East, which is when they, where they fed the streetcars. And that's what you're looking at here. And then they later replaced the entire line in 1934, I wanna say, and then replaced Piedmont and a portion of the main line out to oh, about 70th Avenue West. And so they, they were, they, their trolley bus reached its greatest extent um, in about, um, now let's see how did that go. No, I, I take that back. It reached its greatest extent when the streetcars quit in 39. So um, they replaced the Woodland line and this is the big S curve in Woodland up in Hunter's Park. This is them uh, running on the um, East Superior Street line. And here you see, this is the Grand Avenue line. This is Duluth, Winnipeg and Pacific's West Duluth station. And you got the, the trolley buses are running, but you can still see the streetcar tracks. Now the very last uh, Duluth streetcar, in fact, the very last Twin Cities built streetcar to turn a wheel in regular service was number 269. And in 1939, when the streetcars were abandoned, the Duluth, Mesabi and Iron Range bought it, converted it to a diesel electric and used it for their cruise shuttle on the mile of track between the roundhouse and their yard office up in Proctor. So there you go, that's the Duluth.